tiny. So let me tell you about Michael Cargo. Mike has over 18 years experience in IT and education, having worked as a consultant, analyst, trainer, and teacher, a solution architect, an idle expert, a certified process design engineer, Mike's resume spans several industries, including insurance, manufacturing, retail, food service, and education. Mike has also spent 20 years as an adjunct instructor and trainer, has spoken at several IT and academic events, and several is a lot more, it's much more than several, <laughs> and published white papers on how to begin an IT service management implementation. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, Karen. Thank you, and so glad to be back in in the fold with my sisters and brothers from the academy. I missed you guys. So, um, and you can see the uh, presentation, okay, Karen? Perfectly. Yes. Thank you, Mike. Excellent. And we've missed you too. So we're glad to have you. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to be talking about um, a subject that is uh, very near and dear to my heart, and I'll explain why in, in just a bit. Um, but it's also a very important uh, one for anyone working in the modern day, working with technologies, with processes, and even information. And that is learning how to sort of re-engage or put people back into that mix. So let's talk about some of that. So today what we're going to be talking about is really what is this challenge that we're facing around having people um, in the mix of people, process, and technology, and how do we sort of bring them back to the fore of that? And in doing so, we want to kind of talk about, all right, what does it mean in when we talk about our people or our employees or the employees? What are those, what are people sort of best engaged for? So what are, what is, what are people really uh, suited to do versus process versus technology? So I want to kind of talk about that. Once we kind of know that, then where do we use those people and how do we use them most effectively once we know sort of what, what their um, areas of expertise are? Then how do we sort of support them? and guide them, and that's sort of talking about mentoring and trusting, and then how do we encourage and get them to do better and get the best out of the people, and then ultimately looking at the end at was, why is it sort of wrapping up, why are these all, all of these things sort of important? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's talk about this challenge. The, the challenge really comes from the fact that over time, uh, as many of us know, processes, technology, data, big data are becoming really the norm, right? So these are prevalent in our lives. You, you can't really you know, see anyone these days without some kind of electronic device, cell phone or smartphone or whatever it may be. But in doing so, things are becoming complex in our lives, but also ubiquitous. So we've got things like Internet of Things coming along, right? So our cars are wired, our, our televisions are wired, our refrigerators are wired. Uh, everything is sort of, um, you know, touching into the technology. The difficulty or the real challenge is that as those things have become more prevalent and have uh, moved forward in leaps and bounds, unfortunately, people as living entities really have not changed a whole lot for at least 10,000 years. So who we are in terms of our brain capacity and our, our uh, physical makeup and our thinking abilities and these kind of things really has been the same for quite a while. And people do not change and evolve as quickly as what we produce. So the technologies and the processes we produce changes very rapidly, but the people producing those things don't. And the result has been that in many ways technology is sort of outpacing the people who create it. And if we don't sort of keep in line with that technology and kind of see people as a, as a key element to that, then that gap between the technology and the information and the processes and those people who are sort of behind that, that could lead to a big canyon. And it already is, right? So we just want to make sure that at least it doesn't get any bigger. So that's sort of our challenge. So when we talk about our people, what are we talking about, right? Well, what we're really talking about are employees. And if you're not aware of it, really this concept of an employee, that is, as, as it's defined here, someone that an organization or a person has employed for wages or salary, and generally we think of employees as different sort of from those executive or leadership management levels, but they are employees in a sense as well. That is really a modern concept. 
And what I did was I went out and I did a sort of a Google search using their tools to see how often has the term employee sort of appeared in literature and messaging and, and modern communications. And you can see it really did not start to appear until about after 1880. And really kind of around 1900 is when this concept of an employee really started to emerge. And it was around that time because of the work, we can actually kind of go right back to where this sort of started, to the work of a guy named Frederick Winslow Taylor. And Taylor wrote a book called uh, Scientific Management. And he really sort of invented the concept of managing things, people, technologies, processes, as a science. Before that, there was very little science to managing an organization. There was just doing work. Uh, and the difficulty was, it, given the history of where things were, when Taylor came up with these concepts, it was very much in his day and age um, that drove sort of that, that way of thinking. And you can see from the, the quote that I pulled from his book, actually, uh, written in 1911, um, the way that we'd always looked at employees, or the way that we've sort of traditionally seen this difference between managers and employees or workers, um, it is quite brutal. So he wrote, hardly a competent workman can be found who does not devote a considerable amount of time to studying just how slowly he can work and still convince his employer that he is going at a good pace. Taylor and most of the people in his age, in fact men like um, Henry Ford as well and Alfred Sloan of GM, saw workers as brutes and Taylor actually describes them in his book as brutes, right, that a worker, an employee, is really no one more than can move a, a chunk of iron from one part of a building to another part, and that is all they're capable of. And that really management is this very distinct, different thing, and that employees can never become sort of management. So that, unfortunately, that thought process as employees, as sort of brute force workers, has kind of lingered into the modern day. Not fully, but it is still there. We still have some of these 120-year-old thought processes going on. So how do we kind of restructure that? Well, we restructure that by looking at something called culture. <clears throat> now, many of you may have a sense of what culture is. And, and in a previous life, before coming into IT, I was a teacher and I was a, um, an instructor and professor uh, of history, particularly social and cultural history. So I spent my life for many years studying what is culture. And the way that culture really is defined, and we don't always define it this way in, in business, but this is the way sort of the bigger world defines culture is, this quote down at the bottom, the known environment in which we work, live, and interact, right? And culture is not just one thing. It's not just something that is imposed by leaders. Culture is really uh, grown in a sense. It's created by the combination of things. And there are elements to it, right? There's more than just values or, or ethics or sort of rules and regulations. There are all of these various elements, and you can see that they kind of build on each other. So you have to have some element of protection or, you know, the ability to protect yourself. That's food, clothing, those kind of things. The ability to organize, to have some kind of value, economics, to have um, some kind of social interaction, spiritual or uh, those kind of things, and then ultimately intellectual kind of capacity. So when you're thinking about culture and the role that people play in culture, you want to keep in mind these kind of elements. So how do we take these elements and turn them into what we know today as an organizational culture? Well, it really starts with the individual. So each of us, uh, everyone on the phone, myself, everyone in the world really has a culture, right? It's the known environment in which you work and live and, and interact. And what you bring to the overall organizational culture are, are basically three things. You bring yourself, your personality, who you were born as and who you've grown to be, the talents, that is those inherent things, and we'll talk more about that later, and those skills, those learned things, so nature and nurture. When you take the culture of one person and you combine it into, say, a team or a group of people, you add in a couple of other elements to culture. So the outcomes that those combined personalities and talents, skills, 
students make, the collaborative effort where people are learning and growing from each other and talents are complementing each other and skills are complementing each other. Then you expand that to the organization or the enterprise and what you end up adding there are those values and ethics and rules and regulation and those kind of things. So culture is not something that is imposed from the top down. It's really grown from the inside out, from the individual out. And what we know about culture is when people come and go in an organization, your culture changes. Right? Culture is not something that is static, set once at the beginning of the company and never changes. Um, an example of companies like Apple, with the loss of Steve Jobs, Apple's culture has changed. Maybe not a lot, but it has changed. Right? Every culture, every organization changes a bit as its people come and go because at the core of their culture are their individuals. Right? So we've got to keep that in mind that if we want to sort of make culture a certain way, we have to sort of start with the people. So we have to understand, in, in that makeup, we have to understand, all right, what is it that people can do that is different than, say, technology or process? Because each really has a niche to play in the overall uh, conglomeration of success. And so what we've done is we've thought, you know, in, in IT, especially in the modern day, is, well, process can handle a lot of stuff. Technology can handle a lot of stuff. So those, those kind of come to the fore, but they can't handle everything. So let's talk about a couple of areas that are really better suited to people. One of those is problem solving. So we can use tools, we can use technologies, we can use processes to do problem solving. But problem solving really is something that comes from the human mind. And you can see I've listed some of the great problems of, of our uh, generation. And these are things that were driven to completion or to be solved, not because of the technologies involved, but because of the people involved. Fermat's theorem, one of the hardest math problems ever to exist, solved by an individual who just kept plowing at it, thinking about it, working through it. Um, you know, diseases, putting people into space, uh, keeping planes in the air, keeping ships afloat harnessing electricity, even who we are as people. All of these things were, were done um, based on the people involved, right? So technology and process didn't just wake up one day and go, I think I'm going to solve Fermat's theorem, or I think I'm going to put um, you know, a plane in the air. It was people that really were involved in this. And I love this quote from Albert Einstein, who's one of my favorite sort of intellectual heroes. We cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. Most of you probably know that as Einstein's insanity, right? So doing the same thing over and over, uh, expecting different results, this is the actual quote that he said. This is the words um, that he kind of thought about is, you have to change your thinking. You have to change who you are. Well. Tools can do that to some extent, processes can do that to some extent, but it's really people that we rely on to do that, to change our thinking, right? So problem solving, really key area that we want to leverage people in. Another area we want to leverage people in is innovation. Again, can processes get better? Can technologies and information get better? Yes. But those things happen because of people. And all of these sort of great advances in society and civilization and technology really have come because of people. Uh, the harnessing of fire, the development of language, uh, agriculture, trade, uh, metallurgy and steel into computerization and the internet. These are all really innovations. And I, I used to tell my students when I was teaching, my, uh, my history students, that there is no such thing as invention. Uh, there is only innovation, right? Because what we do as people is we have, we, we learn to combine things and to combine them into new things. And that's really what innovation is, synthesis. And I love this quote again by Steve Jobs. I want to put a ding in the universe. If, you know, there are some people who think of Steve Jobs as a cult kind of thing and he was you know, a great leader of Apple. I personally, in looking at him, kind of saw that what he really added to society as a whole is this drive for innovation, to think differently, to combine old ways into new ways, right? And that's really 
where things like the Mac came from and others, is it wasn't so much that the technologies were new or better, it was how he thought about them, right? And again, processes and technologies, they can't really innovate in and of themselves. They can be used to help innovate, but they don't drive the innovation. So problem solving, innovation, two areas that really people are the key to. So once we know that we have these two areas where people are going to best fit or, or, or work in, how do we get them to sort of serve those purposes in the best way possible? How do we kind of mold and shape people into the best problem solvers and innovators we can find? Well, I rely on, and I think others should rely on, the work of experts in this area, particularly the work that comes out of a gentleman named Marcus Buckingham. And if you're not familiar with him, I would advise you to go um, grab his, his series of books, the first one was called First Break All the Rules. And it really takes a sort of revolutionary insight to how we look at people and how we look at our employees and um, sort of makes that leap where we get rid of that old Frederick Winslow Taylor thinking of employees as brutes and we start seeing them as something greater. All right, and what he did was he took the work of a gigantic study that the Gallup organization had done uh, and kind of plowed through that, analyzed it, and here's what he came up with. There is a difference between talents and skills. Now that sounds very obvious, but one of the things he pointed out is recognizing right, that talents are inherent things. They're things that we're sort of born with. You can't really uh, teach someone a talent in the way that he, he thinks of them. You can teach skills. But when thinking about your employees, our tendency, as Taylor had and, and Ford and others, is they were thinking of them in terms of skills. Buckingham and others are saying, no, maybe we should think about them in terms of their talents first. So first talents, then skills. So he, he goes on in his work to kind of talk about there are three types of talents that people have, striving, thinking, and relating. And you, you are a mix. Everybody is a mix of some of those talents. But we each sort of have one of those that's a little bit more than the other. My personal one is thinking, right? So I, I personally have thinking talents more than, say, striving or relating. Other people are sort of those people people, right? That's relating talents. Other people are striving. They're driven kind of people. The key is to understand in your people what talents they have. And in, in the book, he talks about how to do that. They're, they're um, sort of ways you can figure out which talents. But recognizing that these are uh, inherent things and that um, the revolutionary insight he provides is back to what I started with. 10,000 years of history, people haven't changed that much. We are who we are once we are sort of past that personality development phase in our late teens and into adulthood, we are who we are. And what he indicates is we, we as uh, organizations have this tendency to try to put things into people as if they're missing something. And he's saying people aren't missing anything, right? They are who they are. Don't waste that time trying to put in what you think was left out. Try to look at what people have in terms of their talents and draw them out. That's hard enough. All right. And I love this quote again. I, I'm a big quote guy, if you couldn't figure out. People are not broken. Do not try to fix them. All right. People do not come to your organization half-formed, is what he's saying. They come to you who they are. Make the most of, of what they have. Right. Make the most of who they are rather than trying to mold them into something that they're not. What he proves is most of the time people fail at work not because they don't have what it takes, it's because they've been put into positions or into work where their talents don't serve. All right, so you want to think about that. Now you want to couple that then with the fact that as a society, and, and this is a particular problem for IT, we've had this tendency to equate intelligence in people with logical mathematical, right? Geniuses, when you go out and you do searches for geniuses, geniuses are people who have mathematical skills. Well, what this gentleman Howard Gardner had proved is, no, that's not true. 
right? People have more than one type. There's more than one type of intelligence. There's all of this list of intelligence. And again, you need to understand what your people have. Maybe someone you think is not doing well because you put them into a logical, mathematical type of work really is more bodily kinesthetic, right? They, they need to be more physical or maybe they're more musical or visual spatial. And rather than continuing to force them to do logical mathematical work that is really not where their intelligence or their talents lie, move them them and put them into something more in law intelligence and talents and they will shine. All right, and both of these gentlemen, Buckingham and Gardner, have proven this over and over and over again. Then you need to add in this sense, again, that we are who we are. Right? We're born um, in, in this certain way. We do learn and grow over time uh, and our personality is shaped. But generally what we see, unless there's some kind of big major change in our lives, some kind of traumatic thing or whatever, our personality gets pretty set in our late teens, maybe early, early 20s. And so we need to understand what is the personality that comes into it. The best team I ever worked on was not a team where we each had the best skills. The best team I worked on was four people where each one of us fell into sort of one of these four categories. And it took a while to gel, but once we gelled, we were as solid as a unit as I've ever worked on, right? And that's because we each brought something to the table. Now, whether you're a believer in this DISC personality profile or the Myers-Briggs or any of the other kind of things that are out there, it doesn't really matter which one you use. When you're thinking about where and how I should place people for their work, think as much or maybe even more about their personalities than about their skills. Again, going back to sort of that talent, right? How do they respond to problems? How do they influence? How do they respond to pace and change? How do they do with rules and procedures? And understand that right mix and look for that team and a good, and it's not surprising that an ideal team is really four or five people in size so that you're covering each of these areas. You have someone who is more um, focused in that dominance area, their natural leaders, those influence, those are your people person, your steadiness, that's sort of your rock upon which the, the, uh, the team is founded, right? It's, it, it links it to uh, some kind of grounding thing. And then you have someone who kind of keeps everybody in line. And by understanding their personality, you'll understand then how you can get the most out of them. So how do we get the most out of these people? Well, again, we can turn to an expert like a gentleman named Peter Senge. And Senge did um, a great work, if you've not heard of this, called The Fifth Discipline. And his work really talked about something called the learning organization, that every organization is a learning entity, whether it's the individuals, the teams, the organization as a whole, that what you need to do to be successful is to learn to learn. Right? And that learning leads you ultimately to what he calls the fifth discipline, and that fifth discipline is to think in terms of systems. And it, you know, if you're into service management and ITIL, this is what ITIL is based on, systems thinking. If, if you've done enough sort of deep thinking and reading about it, it's really a system. But to get to that, you've got to start by having people you know, master their environment, You've got to put in place mental models that has to do with that culture again, right? How people think and see and do things. You have to have that shared vision. Where are we all going? Are we all headed in the same direction? You have to learn as a team so you can't sort of leave people behind. And then you have to recognize in systems thinking that you are one part of a much bigger whole and that as you change one part, you affect other parts of it. Right? So if I make a change to say change management process or I, make, uh, I implement say a new financial management process, I can't just think of that in a vacuum. I have to think about if I bring these things in or if I mod or, uh, modify them, what is that going to do to how I'm doing other things? Right? And what he talked about is you've got to have something called double loop learning. Um, and uh, systems learning, that is you've got to learn from your mistakes. Right? So 
think about that. How are you taking your people, once you sort of know their personalities, know the culture that you're building, how do you get them to that bigger picture thinking? Well, one way you can do that is to um, think sort of around this concept called the near win. Uh, Sarah Lewis is someone who presented at TED, if you're not familiar with TED, uh, Technology, Entertainment, and Design, and it's a, a series of presentations that people give out on, you can go out to their website. And what she talked about is um, something called this near win, and what is the near win? Well, the near win is that moment where you're almost there. And she described it as sort of this point between success and mastery, right? So success is something that's externally driven. Someone comes to you and says, I want you to do X. You do it, you've succeeded. I want you to accomplish this deliverable. I want you to write this document. I want you to implement this process. I want you to deploy this tool. You do it, you're successful. And it's momentary. Once it's done, it's done. Mastery is something that is internally driven, and it's really long-term, and, and this quote from her TED talk is really sort of um, appropriate. So she, in looking at, she was watching some uh, female archers, and uh, it really kind of struck her, right, that these women that were practicing were spending hours and hours and hours and hours doing this, and she, she was like, why? And she recognized that's because, you know, success, that momentary fleeting thing, that's hitting the ten ring, the, the bullseye. But mastery is knowing it means nothing if you can't hit it again and again and again. And to be able to do that, you have to kind of live on this, this raw edge, this edge between I've done it once and I can do it every time. And you've got to kind of live at that point where things are never good enough. Things are never complete. Even when you've been successful, you're working on a project or an effort, you've, you've completed it, you should be asking yourself, what more could I have done? What more could we have been successful with? There's always that sort of moment to go further and get that mastery. All right, so you want to drive your, kind of think about your people and work with your people, work with employees, your coworkers, even employee to manager in this way, right? Driving each other to this near win. Once you've kind of supported people and you've got them sort of set up for success, you've got them thinking about mastering their domain, you've got them in the right place, you've got them working on problem solving and innovation, those kind of things then how do we as organizations, how do we as managers, how do we as coworkers, how do we help people s sort of through uh, their lives? And what we're really talking about is what's the right distance for us to be away or, or how close should we be to coworkers, how far away should we be from them or from manager to, to employee? So we want to kind of talk about what is that appropriate distance. So on one sort of end, you've got this concept of mentoring. And the thing I always like to remind people about mentoring is you cannot appoint a mentor. Mentors are not things you appoint. Mentors are experienced and trusted advisors that you just sort of naturally find. You find mentors in your life. And I, I put this picture here. On the right-hand side is mentor. Mentor was a person. And this concept of mentoring comes from this. So he was a Greek philosopher, and he had a, a protege named Telemachus. And the relationship that they built, right, the older, wiser, more experienced gentleman with the younger um, gentleman trying to learn and grow, that then became a model for what we know as mentoring. And this, this model that Mentor and Telemachus set up really was one of um, double loop learning, that is learning from our mistakes. It was an exchange, so it wasn't Mentor telling Telemachus, do it this way or do it that way. It was Mentor having conversations with Telemachus and Telemachus then kind of responding to that. So it became a conversation and that's really what mentoring should be. It should be a conversation. It shouldn't be orders or directives or uh, kind of imposed on people. So if you're going to kind of come close to someone, think about how you're going to do that. Think about how can I make that a conversation with my people. 
Now on the other end, we have this concept of trust. And that is, how do I move away from someone and let them do what they're supposed to do? And if you've not heard of Patrick Lencioni and his book, Five Dysfunctions of Team, I, I'd suggest go get that. Because what he talks about in terms of being a successful team, having employees and management and groups of people working together well, is based on this concept of trust, right? So at the what, what he indicated is, when there is no trust in a team, all of the things above it, um, constructive uh, work, um, loyalty and commitment, accountability and attention to results, these things won't happen, right? And you've got to build from that sort of bottom up. So you've got to start with this layer of trust. Once you have trust, you've got to sort of build in this openness, uh, this ability to kind of talk to each other. Now, one of the things I love about working for tech systems, um, you know, and I work on the on the consulting global services side, is we have this concept called carefrontation. And it sounds a little cheesy, but the idea is a good one, right? The idea is if you have an issue with someone else, go deal with that issue, right? Don't tell your manager. Don't go whine to other people. Confront this person come to them and say openly and honestly, hey, we're having an issue here. Let's talk about it. And that's sort of what uh, Lencioni is talking about. That can only happen when you have trust. Once you've gotten past those, those conflicts, then you have this shared commitment, this shared loyalty. We're all going in the same direction. Then that leads to accountability, right? We all are willing to step up and say, hey, I was part of the team, and as that, if, the, if I failed, the team fails. If the team fails, I fail. But on the inverse, if the team wins, I win. If I win, the team wins. And then that's what drives that attention to results. So how do we get that trust? How do we sort of build that, the, that layer in? Right? Well, the first thing you have to do, you have to presume trust. Uh, Ronald Reagan is famous for a statement he made back, I believe, in the 1980s, um, trust but verify, in talking about the, the Soviet Union. Here's the problem with that statement. It's a contradiction. Trust in and of itself assumes you don't need to verify, right? It's a faith-based kind of thing is if you trust someone, there is there should be no need to verify. Because if you need to verify, you don't really trust that person. And that's really what we're talking about is complete full trust. Well, how do you get that? I, I put this little matrix down in the corner to kind of show you, right, is trust is something that comes out of having consistent messages and being sincere in those messages and those in those communications. When you are sincere and when you are consistent, then you will in, engender high trust. If you're not consistent and you're not sincere, that's where you have no trust or low trust. So if you keep saying to, to someone, yeah, I've got your back, I'm going to be there to help you, and then something goes wrong and you throw that person under the bus or you know you, you hang them out to dry, there's no trust. Right, so you want to build that layer of trust. It's a very, very difficult thing for most people to do, right? To have that layer of trust in there, to be open and honest, to be almost brutally honest, right? Not so much that you're hurting people's feelings, but that you're coming through with a truthful message. Sometimes it's called fierce conversations, right? And you're you're working to kind of bring out the issues and talking about it and being transparent, not sort of letting it eat in into yourself. Um, and then, you know, if you say you're going to do something, be there. I always used to tell my children, I never use the word promise. In in you know, my oldest son is 30 something, my daughter is 20. I, I, in a, their lifetimes, I probably use the word promise a handful of times because to me, a promise is a 100% guarantee, right? And if you can't really ensure you're coming through 100% for your people, then, you know, don't promise. And be willing to kind of step up and say, hey, I was part of the issue, right? So you got to engender that trust. And so what you end up seeing is that mentoring and trusting are in many ways the same thing. They're not opposites, right? So it's about balance. It's about finding how much trust do you want to give? Are you willing to give more than how much trust your person needs? So how do you help that along? Well, one of the ways you can help that along and kind of show that consistency, have more effective personal interactions. So here's some suggestions for you how to make that happen. Um, you know, 
make sure you don't have those distractions. One of the things I've found is if you don't know the eye color of the person you're talking to, you haven't looked directly at them. And if you're not looking directly at them and you know that sort of eye contact, then you're probably not paying attention to them. Ask questions rather than making statements, right? And if the conversation is sort of waning, use questions to sort of lubricate it, get it going again, taking it another direction. Sitting on the edge of your chair, right, makes you attentive, makes you, that person feel you're, you're sort of with them. Um, make notes, right? You've got a lot of stuff going in your mind, write things down, and then turn off that cell phone. I know it's hard to do, put it in a drawer, but give that person that full attention. It shows that you're trusting them and that you're willing to work with them closely. And then internally, right, think about how you need to be more accountable. Focus on the problem, not on the person, right? Is the problem that uh, perhaps they're not in the right work or that they haven't been given clear enough instructions? Did they write them down? Did you give them a due date? Did you get them to kind of say, yes, I believe I can do this. Yes, I can accomplish this. And then think about you know, an early check-in. That's not a verification. It's just, hey, just checking in. Do you have everything you need to be successful to master this? Yep, I got it. Okay, talk to you later. Don't micromanage. Come back at an appropriate time later. Again, got everything you need? Yep, okay, I'll be back later. All right, so step up to that challenge with your people. Step up to um, that communication and that accountability that, again, engenders that trust. And both effective interactions and accountability are part of good mentoring. All right, so we, we've got our people set up for success. We are there to guide and support them. But now how, how do we get them to move forward? How do we get them to strive for that mastery, to go for that near win? Well, what we're talking about is motivation. All right? If you're going to Fusion, you will have the fortune of meeting this gentleman, Daniel Pink. So he is the opening keynote at Fusion, and I am just super excited. I love this guy's work. What he did was he analyzed the results of a government study. And what this study basically showed is if you're doing work that is not cognitive, that is not sort of thinking, is purely physical or um, you know repetitive motion driven, working on an assembly line or digging a ditch or whatever, money can be a motivator. As soon as you have any shred of cognitive involvement, a funny thing happens. The more money you pay someone, the worse the performance becomes. So what he saw was, and they tested this over and over and over again, is that above a certain amount of money, basically when someone's basic need for food, clothing, shelter, these kind of basic needs are taken care of, what happens is the more money you pay someone above that certain level, their performance actually starts to drop. And that's because money is not a motivator after that point. Once your needs are taken care of, your basic needs, people look for bigger things. And this kind of goes in line with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're familiar with that. And what he showed through the, through the analysis of these uh, results was people are looking for three things. Mastery, and I've said that several times already, right? So our people want to become masters of things. They want to become some better. They want to live in that world of the near win. They're always striving. And what he showed is things like Linux and um, there's a company called Atlassian and others. These things were not created during work, right? These things were created on the weekends away from work. People's best work are when it's on their time to be able to strive for something that they feel is important to them. Autonomy. People do not want to be micromanaged. They do not want to be, the, you know, kind of have someone uh, in their face all the time. They want to be told, here is, is where I want you to go. Get yourself there. Right? And they want to guide themselves and they want to self-direct those futures. So some autonomy. And then people want to feel part of a bigger purpose. Right? They don't want to do things for the sake of doing things. They want to feel like they're, as, as Steve Jobs says, they want to feel like they're putting a ding in the universe. They want to leave a mark. They want to leave a legacy. 
And it's these three things that really motivate people, especially in our world, our knowledge world, our, our knowledge and consulting and um, ITSM kind of world, right? So think about that. Are you trying to drive people through money or are you trying to drive people and motivate them through allowing them to be masters, allowing them to have autonomy, and allowing them to have their own purpose or be part of the bigger purpose of the organization, right? So think about that. That's really a key thing for that motivation. Another way that we motivate people, uh, and this, this part I think may surprise a lot of people, um, uh, is to potentially use something like the philosophy of Bruce Lee. Now, many of you may be familiar with Bruce Lee as one of the world's great martial artists, uh, died very, uh, unfortunately, very young. Um, but he came up with what many people initially think of as this new martial arts style called Jeet Kune Do. And Jeet Kune Do means way of the intercepting fist. But if you were to talk to, to Bruce Lee or even look at interviews with him, it's really not a martial art. It's a philosophy. And what he talks about was, you know, somebody asked him, well, what is your fighting style? What is your martial arts style? He said, I don't have a style. He said, I fight without fighting. And it really kind of threw people for a, for a loop there a bit because they're like, well, what do you mean? You don't do karate. You don't do, um, you know, taekwondo. But what it turns out is if you've ever seen him do his stuff, he is just amazing. And it's because of this personal philosophy that drives him. So I've put down sort of the core of what, of what Jeet Kune Do really said and what Bruce Lee was talking about, right? Which is, what are you thinking about today? Your focus at any given time is where your energy is at, right? So if you're not thinking about the work that's in front of you, you're really not putting a lot of energy into it. You're not really putting your heart and soul into it. So what are you thinking about? You should be working on those things where, you're, where your heart and energy is. Simplify, keep it simple, right? Eliminate all of the complexity in life, get back down to the basics. Because we have this tendency as people and employees and managers to make life way more complex than it ever needed to be. So he said simplify. Keep things simple in your life. Learn about yourself. Reflect inward. Double loop learning. What mistakes have I made? What better ways can I do things? Especially in interactions with other people. Kind of step outside yourself and look at yourself. Do not divide. Right. Focus on one thing. Right? And that, that was the thing, if you watch him in his martial arts, his focus is incredible. Right, He does one thing at a time. There is no such thing as multitasking. Multi, the human brain is really not capable of multitasking. What multitasking is, is the ability to switch between things very quickly. But Lee said, don't even do that. Focus on one thing, get that done, then focus on the next thing. Right? And don't look for that outside validation. Don't keep looking for other people to say, hey, you're doing a good job. You're doing great. Look for that inside yourself. Are you satisfied with the job that you've done? And if you're not, then be proactive. Go out and learn how to do it better, how to kind of drive yourself. So the summary of what Jeet Kune Do really says is be you and make you the best you that you can be. Right. So look for, and why I brought him up is I, I think you, people need to look beyond just sort of the normal sets of uh, business books and things and look at other kind of philosophies and ideas that are out there that are really appropriate and, and Bruce Lee's philosophy is, is really appropriate. So some, some to do's for people. So how do we take all of this and then kind of make people back into that part of uh, people process and technology? Well, first of all, when you're selecting a person, choose for talent, right? Skills can be taught. And if you have good teachers, good teachers can teach most everybody the right skills, right? But you can't teach those talents. So think about what talent someone, right? Set the expectations. What do you expect someone to do? Where do you expect them to go? What purpose do you ex uh, expect them to achieve? Be clear about that, right? Motivate them and focus on those strengths, right? Let them be them, let them master their world, drive themselves, as Daniel Pink says, um, and, and be who they're supposed to be. And then develop the person appropriately, 
right? What are the things that they need in their lives to be successful? Is it training? Is it education? Is it more interactions? Is it mentoring? Is it more trust? All of these kind of things. That's how you sort of grow these people into this um, more successful position. So I want to kind of sum it up and talk about, so, so why is it that people are important? Well, what I want to do is just kind of put some quotes on the, on the uh, screen and let you kind of look at them, and they're, they're in the materials you want to look at them. I'm not going to read them to you, but um, I love this first quote by Adam Smith. If you're not familiar with Adam Smith, Adam Smith is the father of capitalism. Right, And if you really, really read his works and what he said about capitalism, right, he said, the value of something is not the price you're paying for it, it's not um, the cost of the materials, it's not all of that. The value of something is the quantity of people, labor, right, the quantity of labor or work which it enables a person to purchase or command. Right? That capitalism is really not about dollars and cents. Capital is really about the exchange of labor. Right? That's how we measure really the value of commodities. It's the people that are key, not the things. And then I love this bottom quote by Henry David Thoreau, again, one of my great favorites, um, the philosophers. So if you're not familiar with him, he went off into the woods near um, Concord, uh, Massachusetts, lived on a pond for a couple years, a Walden Pond, wrote a book about it. And he says this out of those books. I learned this, at least by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours, right? So it was about being true to yourself, as, as Bruce Lee would say, being you, about letting your people and yourself, so this applies not just as manager to employee, but letting people be who they are. And when you let people be who you are, they will do amazing things. They will solve world problems. They will innovate beyond your greatest expectations. But you gotta let them be people. You've gotta let them kind of do what they need to do and be who they're going to be. And with that, um, I think we're ready for some questions, Karen. Thank you, Mike. Boy, that is a very, very thoughtful presentation. And I'm sitting here feeling really good. About myself. Good. You know, yeah, I was just like, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that was great. Um, so if you have questions, please chat them in for us now, if you would do that. So far, I don't have any questions, Mike, so we're, I'm hoping that people are going to ask us some questions. I've had a tendency lately to stun people into silence, so it doesn't <laughs> surprise me. <laughs> oh, on, on. Purpose or, on purpose or inadvertently. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there's a question or two out there. And I, and I would suggest to people, you know, if, if you're, you know, um, interested in, in um, conversing with me long term, I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Twitter, I'm on probably every social media that there ever existed or will exist. So uh, I'm, I think so. I think so. As, as, as the ladies in the academy know, I'm an open book. So Elias says it's a wow moment. He's at a wow moment. <laughs> oh, wow moment. Wow. That's yeah. uh, I'm blushing. So, there you go, right? Um, but let's Thank just you. give them a couple of minutes to um, ask some questions. And before we do start the Q&A session, I just wanted to say, for those of you that do need to drop off, I'd like to remind you that our next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, October 15th, when ITSM Academy's President Jane Grohl and Curriculum Development Manager Donna Knapp join us. And their presentation is titled, DevOps Ask the Experts. And DevOps is emerging as an industry buzzword what does DevOps mean? Is it relevant to enterprise IT? How does it relate to idle and IT service management, agile, lean, and tools? Jane and Donna will be available to answer your questions and provide insight into the benefits, practices, and challenges of creating a DevOps environment. So we do look forward to having you join us. And we'll continue to bring you practitioner presentations discussing agile and IT service management implementation experiences and challenges. And if you'd like to share your implementation experience or your implementation challenges with us, just let us know. We'd be happy to work with you and, and make that happen for you at one of our webinars. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, 
Eric Montijo. Eric is here today to share some information with us. Hello, Eric. Hi, Karen. Thanks for introducing me. Um, and thanks very much, Michael, for giving a great web webinar today. Uh, you made some excellent points about people, uh, how their talents should be considered before their skills, and that trust is the foundation of, eff of an effective culture. Um, this got me thinking, what if we built our process around human resources and not solely shoehorn our human resources into perfect process? I think it can be done, and I think I have a class that can help with, it, with that. A certified process design engineer transcends the what and helps you build an appropriate how. CPDE applies to every service management framework, whether you're in idle, adopting DevOps, or anything in between. With this course, your organization can shoot not just for success, but all the way to mastery. Our next CPDE course is beginning October 16th, and for a short time, it's 20% off on our website. It's kind of an added bonus just for our webinar attendees. I'm going to give away anyone, anyone that purchases the CPDE course on the 19th will receive a free seat to our DevOps overview course on the 9th, October 9th. Uh, DevOps is the cultural phenomenon that is enabling organizations to develop, deploy, and operate quality software faster to meet business needs. Uh, simply purchase the course on itsmacademy.com and put in the comments, I attended the webinar, and we'll see details. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me on our web or by phone at 954-491-3442. I look forward to seeing everyone in class and uh, hope you Thank you, Eric. We think it's a great class. Mike and I are both CPDEs. Yes, yes. <laughs> I highly recommend the course. <laughs> exactly, right? All right, we do have questions for you, Mike. Are you ready? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Alfonso said, I'll second that wow. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks, Alfonso. Um, Carolyn has a question, and she wants to know, how does the structure of the organization enable or not people? So one of the things, there's, there's sort of an old joke that goes around, you know, that we, we no longer live in the age of uh, command and control. We live in an age of networks and that the only organizations that still need command and control uh, are churches and uh, the military. Right, so uh, that's one of the things, you know, the, the age of Taylor and Ford and that that's where we got this idea and they did take it out of the military of you know effective management of people is done in this command and control structure well um, that may be appropriate for some organizations but what you want to look at is not just assume that sort of that chain or hierarchy system might work for your organization but rather look at the combination of talents that you have look at who your people are what they want to do and then build the organization around that as opposed to building an organization and then trying to slot people in so Carolyn, that's what I was talking about in terms of availability is not a skill set, it's not a talent, right? So that's what we have this tendency to do. I have an open spot, I have an available person, I'm going to just slot them in there, and then they fail. Why? Because they weren't supposed to be there. That's not what they're good at, that's not where their talents lay, uh, they can't build trust with you, they can't sort of accomplish and be successful, they can't live in the near win. So what we have to start doing is, as organizations and people is kind of looking at, all right, if I'm more of a, say, entrepreneurial kind of company, command and control is not going to work, right? I've got to give people some freedom, and you see that a lot in a lot of startup organizations. But over time, what you may have to find is some kind of hybrid. You may need some type of control and hierarchy as you get larger, but then allow some freedom within parts of your organization. So, um, and I think in uh, things like Agile and DevOps and these, uh, self-starting or self-managed or self-led teams might be appropriate. So don't just assume that the old um, standard ways of organizing are going to be effective into the future. Great answer. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Holly, Holly's got a question for you. Can you please explain near win a little further? Just like a little yeah. more detail on that. Yeah, so near win, this concept from, from Sarah Lewis, is this, this idea that if I, and again, I'll go back to the archery thing. So I go out and I shoot, um, you know, at the target. Well, I may say, hey, I hit the bullseye, I'm successful, I'm a great archer. 
But it's not about just hitting it that one time. It's about doing that over and over and over again to the point where it's what I call mental muscle memory, right? That what, what you're doing is you're not even thinking about what you're doing. You're just doing your body sort of and your mind just sort of naturally take over. But in order to be at that, you have to stay sharp, right? If you forget to use these talents and forget to kind of um, practice the muscles, they get stiff, right? Your brain kind of um, atrophies in a sense or gets gets um, stuck a little bit. You probably experience this idea in um, use it or lose it, right? You've not done some activity in such a long time, you forget how to approach it. That's what this near win concept is really about, is if you want to master something, you've got to constantly be pushing yourself right to that edge, right? So again, back to the archery. If I could hit one bullseye, right, my next goal may be let me hit 10 in a row, let me hit 20 in a row, 30 in a row, 50 in a row, right? So you're constantly pushing that edge, that that sort of goal you're achieving for. And what that does is keep you sharp, keep you right there. And it's not about actually hitting 20, right? It's about the goal that you're setting and you keep striving for it. So the near win is, you know, I set a goal for, for you know, doing something 20 times in a row successfully. I only hit it 19. All right, let's start again. Let's go back and do it again. Let's try again. That's really that concept of the near win, and, and hopefully that explains a little bit in more in depth. Yes, it did. Thank you, Mike. Um, John has a question for you. He's saying, any comments on Ed Deming's words about management being the primary source of process variation? How can we possibly succeed when management prevents us from success? So you have to understand, and I'm a huge fan of Deming, you have to understand um, what um, Deming meant by management, right? So Deming did not necessarily mean management in an organizational structure kind of sense. He meant more what we talk about as um, process owners and process managers, right? So it's the people who own the process, it's the people who manage the process, it's the people who own and manage the system that are ultimately accountable for making sure that that's successful. And so what they've got to do is recognize that it's not, you know, as a process owner, it's not just you, right? You're not the only one who goes out there and, and improves a process. And if you take CPDE, as, as Eric suggested, you'll learn some of this, right? Is it's really a team of people that have to make this um, kind of work, but ultimately it falls on you as that owner, right? As that manager. And um, if you know Deming, you know he he was indicating that it's really not um, it, it's not the individual effect of a person on something that makes it better. It's kind of what Peter Senge talked about. It's that team. It's what Lencioni talked about. It's that team effort. Right, that you have to go in and fix the system to make things successful, but to fix the system requires people. So that's kind of how Deming, and, and if you read Deming, Deming's writings are kind of all over the place, but you can kind of see that thread through there, that behind process improvement and process ownership are the people. Hopefully that answers the question. Yes, it did, Mike. Um, I have a couple of more questions for you. Sure. But Karen, and, I'm jumping in yeah. just to say it is noon. Mm-hmm. Time goes quickly, doesn't it? Yes. So for anybody who needs to leave, if they would like to, ne the next webinar, as Karen said, is actually a Ask the Expert um, around DevOps and Agile. And so we'd love for people to pre-submit questions for us. Um, because it's going to be an open panel as much as the tool will allow for it to be an open panel for us. So if you have questions, you can email anyone on the team. You can email info at itsmacademy.com. Um, you can uh, use Twitter to send it in to us. Um, we also have a chat 
feature on our website, so you can just go to itsmacademy.com and chat it in and say this is a question for the next webinar, however you want to get them to us. But your questions are really what we want our experts to ask. So you know, smoke signal them in, people, but if you have questions <laughs> about all the hubbub around DevOps and Agile, please get them to us so that um, Donna and Jane can field those questions in next month's webinar, and I am sorry to interrupt. No, oh, that's great. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so that's going to be a dynamic one. Um, okay, so I do have some more for you, Mike. Um, Elias has a, um, has a question and then a statement as to why he's asking this. He said, I wish that we um, could have a follow-up session. He said, question number one, how do we link the people concept with people technology process concept of outsourcing? Do we really all agree outsourcing is successful from the people perspective? And he said, no, this is from, um, from noticing many organizations moving towards outsourcing their IT service provisions, and all are becoming dependable with short and long-term contractors with less motivation and privileges. He said, not money, it's not my money issue actually. Yeah, so um, if you read best practices, it really indicates, you know, outsourcing is not a bad model if you use it correctly, and the problem is most organizations are not using it, right? Outsourcing should not be a money or bottom line decision, right? It should be about the services that your organization has and the talents and skills that your organization has, right? And so what you should keep in-house are those things that are your core talents and skills. So let's say you're a, an app dev or a development, a software company, right? Focus in on those things that are core to who you are, development. Outsource those things that are better served by talents from other companies. So things like um, maybe your HR function, right? So if you're not an HR company by nature, don't try to be, it goes along with what Buckingham said is don't, and what Bruce Lee said, don't try to be something you're not. Just be who you are. So if you're an app dev company, be an app dev company, and then outsource those things that are really served by someone else. The problem is, um, Elias, that we do it from the bottom line. And it's the funniest thing because, you know, what's the first thing that so many organizations do? Outsource their service desk. What does best practices kind of infer or actually imply that you should not be outsourcing? Your service desk. Why? Because that's your link to your customer. That's the face and voice of your customer. And if you are a customer service kind of company, that kind of capability should remain in-house. And if, you know, if you're not an application development company, then get that out of the out of the organization, right? Hire the application development capabilities and skills and talents of someone else to do that work on your behalf. It's really what an underpinning contract from ITIL language is all about, right? Is that you're recognizing somebody else can do this better than you, they have the talents and the skills, let them do it and then just set up that agreement with them so that they are providing you what you need and they're handling it. So, passionate answer there. <laughs> yes, great answer though, really, great answer. Um, I, I also have a lot of comments here, Mike, that is, you know, great presentation, lots of information we can use. Thank you so much. So there's a lot of accolades for you here as well. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I know perhaps some of my former students on there. So thank you. I appreciate it. I, I do miss do miss the academy, <laughs> despite the rumors. <laughs> yeah, I do. I, so. And John has a question for you. He's saying, any comments on a potential evolution for specialization of labor in the form of tasks at all levels of the organization? Everyone has a request or incident, and you get paid by completing or creating tasks, including managerial and executive levels. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, so that's a, yeah. I have to think about that for a second because that's a really interesting way to see things. Um, and I, I guess I would say that. Um, 
you'd have to look at that in the scope of an organization and if they're capable of doing that. Again, do you have the talents and skills to be able to do that? So some organizations may not be able to handle that because they don't have, and it kind of goes to that outsourcing question we were just talking about, right? What are your core capabilities? So um, before going down that path with an organization, I I'd say you really want to look at, is it something the organization has the talents and skills, the sort of systems thinking to be able to do, or could they learn it, right, along those lines of Peter Senge, could you learn to do those things? It is an interesting model, and it's it's something that maybe, um, maybe I need to think a little bit more about it um, to give a more in-depth answer. But. You know what we can do with it, Mike? Um, we'll put it on the Q and A, and we'll we'll have you answer that. Okay. And then we, then we'll send it out, and then they'll have the information that way. Sure. That. Great. Yeah. yeah? Okay. I, I just and, don't want to. I don't want to give an answer that that is um, sort of not thoughtful. So. Sure. Of course. And and John said, um, great job to you, Mike, and to the academy. Keep sharing the knowledge. <laughs> so. <laughs> that's what that's what it's what the academy does best. So. Yes. Perfect. Right. Exactly, and um, that's all of the questions that I have right now, so if anybody else has any last minute questions, just let me know, and while you're doing that, I would just like once again to thank Mike for sharing his knowledge with us again, and it's always a pleasure to have you with us, Mike, so. Well, thank you, Karen. forward to having you again. All right, yeah. Yes, and then once again, I'd like to remind everybody that the next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, October 15th, when ITSM Academy's President Jane Grohl and Curriculum Development Manager Donna Knapp join us. And their presentation is titled DevOps Ask the Experts. So as, as Lisa had mentioned, you know, pre-submit your questions for this. They're going to talk about, you know, what does DevOps mean? Is it relevant to enterprise IT? How does it relate to idle and IT service management? How does it relate to agile, lean, and tools? So they'll be here to answer questions and provide lots of insight into the benefits, practices, and challenges of creating that DevOps environment. So feel free to pre-submit your uh, your questions for them, and you can certainly do it but at info, I-N-F-O, at ITSMacademy.com. You can tweet it in using hashtag ITSMacademy. Um, as Lisa said, you can go on our website, you can chat it in, or you can just send it in to you know, any, any of the members of the Academy, and we'd be happy to do that for you. And 